Consider this before viewing the digestive system. Your body needs food for energy and strength. The digestive system breaks down food into energy. Consider what you know about digestion. As you watch the program, note how various organs are all connected and the roles they play in the digestive process. Assignment Discovery now presents the digestive system. Digestion. It seems so simple. You eat food and your body breaks it down so it can nourish you. But along the way, from your mouth through your gut, anything can go wrong, from heartburn to ulcers. Hi, I'm Kat Carney. Join me as we take a guided tour down the digestive tract, all 24 feet of Digestion is the process of breaking food down into smaller and smaller pieces. Food you swallow travels down your esophagus and into your stomach where digestive juices begin attacking it. The liver and pancreas contribute their own digestive juices which flow into your small intestine. Here, food is broken down into individual molecules that can be absorbed into your bloodstream. What remains is pushed up and around the large intestine and finally out the anus. It's a journey that can take from 20 hours to several days. I'm here with Dr. Marsha Cohen and is this what I think it is? It certainly is what you think it is. Well, I know that's the esophagus. That is the esophagus. I know the esophagus is basically a passageway to move the food to the stomach. But what happens to the food once it gets to the stomach? Okay, first of all, the stomach is a bag. Okay, and we have it opened here so that you can see what the inside looks like. Two of the important things that it does is that it produces acid and it produces enzymes because this is the primary place that the proteins you eat are broken down. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing it does is that it grinds and it continues to mush up what you've chewed up and produces a fluid called chyme which will eventually enter into the small intestine where more things happen. Most of the time, our digestive system works flawlessly, churning food through its passageways day in and day out. But at some point in our lives, something goes wrong, and we suffer a stomach ache. The stomach ache is a vague term for any sort of discomfort uh, that occurs in the belly, which really covers uh, anywhere from the low part of the chest uh, down to above your legs. Uh, usually it's something very innocuous. A stomach ache can be nagging, inconvenient, embarrassing, and extremely painful. Whether it's from constipation, diarrhea, gas, or nausea. Nausea is the uncomfortable feeling that you really need to vomit. Uh, it can be caused by a number of different uh, conditions, including common viral illnesses of the stomach, stomach flu, uh, or from motion sickness. But in general, it's not harmful and it will simply pass. Gas and even gas pains are normal byproducts of digestion, and belching or passing gas up to 20 times a day are normal. When food moves too quickly through your digestive tract and less liquid is absorbed by the large intestine, you get diarrhea. 
too slowly so more water is absorbed, that's constipation. Antidiarrheal drugs slow the movement of food through the intestines or regulate the action of intestinal muscles. Laxatives treat constipation by softening feces or by stimulating intestinal muscles. At least once a month, more than 60 million Americans suffer from acid indigestion, also known as heartburn. Heartburn occurs when acid flows up from the stomach into the esophagus, causing pain and discomfort. Causes of heartburn include overeating, alcohol, and smoking. Heartburn medications include antacids, which relieve pain by neutralizing stomach acid, and other over-the-counter medications called H2 blockers, which reduce the amount of acid the stomach produces. Both can be quite effective with ordinary heartburn, but sometimes heartburn goes beyond the ordinary. Robin Clifford, a tech support engineer and film critic, was suffering from gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, an extreme form of heartburn. Between the esophagus and the stomach is a valve called the lower esophageal sphincter. Normally, it opens to let food down, then closes so food can't get back up. But with GERD, a weakness in the sphincter allows stomach contents to flow back into the esophagus. The acid in the stomach burns the lining of the esophagus, because it can stay there for quite some time, and causes pain. And that burning feeling, often called heartburn, or acid indigestion, is what patients with GERD feel. But GERD is not your garden variety heartburn. It occurs much more frequently, at least twice a week. It may involve regurgitating stomach contents into the mouth, difficult or painful swallowing, and even chest pain. GERD can also cause chronic inflammation, which in rare cases can result in cancer of the esophagus. Early on, when I first started having the problem, I was taking uh, over-the-counter things just to kind of keep things calm. After suffering for years, Robin graduated from over-the-counter to prescription medications. But nothing stopped the GERD. And it got to the point where uh, I sometimes wouldn't even be able to eat a meal because the burning in the stomach. Would, nothing would put out the fire. After medications failed to cure his GERD, Robin finally opted for surgery with Dr. Desmond Burkett of the Leahy Clinic near Boston. The operation strengthens the lower esophageal sphincter by wrapping the top of the stomach around it, creating a collar. Now, when there's pressure in the stomach that would have made food reflux through the sphincter, the collar squeezes the sphincter shut. Recovery is remarkably quick. Most patients go home after only one night, as Robin did. I'm amazed by the recovery process here. I felt great. I didn't have any heartburn whatsoever. Uh, was, went back to a normal routine. Didn't eat normally. And that's, gonna, that's the longest part, is to get back to a normal diet. But after only six weeks on a limited diet, pepperoni pizza doesn't give Robin the slightest twinge. The, the results of this operation are excellent. 95% of people immediately lose their heartburn and reflux and need to take no more medications at all. After 10 years of having daily uh, acid attacks, I have none. No. Zero problems. D. Hill is one of 25 million Americans who suffer from ulcers. Painful sores or holes in the lining of the stomach or the duodenum, part of the small intestine. But an ulcer is, comes in different degrees, and if it gets really big, it has a potential for bleeding, or worse, it can uh, perforate. You actually get a hole through the stomach lining so that acid and food can go straight into the abdomen, and if you have that happen, it requires immediate operation. It's very painful. 
you have constant pain in your stomach. And it's more like a throbbing, almost like a toothache, a really bad toothache in your stomach. About a million Americans are hospitalized for ulcers each year, and some 6,500 die. Healthcare costs approach $6 billion annually. Until recently, doctors thought they knew what caused ulcers, but they were wrong. 50, maybe 100 years, people had thought that ulcers were caused by, by acid or by stress. Acid and stress can make ulcers worse, but they're not the main cause. It wasn't until 1982 that Australian doctors discovered the chief culprit, a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori, or H. pylori. For years, many doctors, including Dee's, refused to believe in the bacterium's guilt. But when Dee learned about H. pylori, she leaped into action. By searching the internet, Dee found a doctor who had been on the forefront of H. pylori research almost since its discovery. Dr. David Cave of St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston. Where do you get that sensation? It's the sensation is around that. Right. The trunk, the whole trunk is really sore. Dr. Cave discovered that D had not just one, but two ulcers. And H. pylori was present. Can you give me some idea how severe it is? Does it stop you doing what you're doing? Yes, it does stop me. It stopped me completely. To kill the bacteria, Dr. Cave treated D with antibiotics. But her H. pylori didn't just roll over and die. I had five treatments and I was still in a lot of pain and I got to the point where my stomach was spasming. So I called Dr. Cave and he goes, wait, let's try one more thing. Because of my research interests, I was able to actually go down into a stomach with a scope, take a little biopsy, grow the bug out, test it for its bacterial resistance to antibiotics. And he said, um, we're going to buy, we biopsied your tissues, we examined them in the lab, and we're going to develop a cocktail just for you. And I could design a specific group of antibiotics that I was able to successfully treat her. According to Dr. Cave, a course of two antibiotics plus an acid suppressing agent usually gets rid of 85% of ulcers. Dee's case was unusually difficult, so victory was especially sweet. I don't wake up in the middle of the night crying, I'm pain free and it's because I didn't give up and that I trusted myself and I felt that possibly I could get cured. I feel like a new person. All right, so once the food moves into the small intestine, what happens here? Okay, two major things happen in the small intestine. One, we have bile that comes from the gallbladder to go into the small intestine. That's why the small intestine is staying green. Mm -hmm. And we also have enzymes that come into the small intestine. And the enzymes and the bile help to take the food molecules, get them very, very small, so that they then can be absorbed by the small intestine. And as you can see, there's a million wrinkles on this small intestine. Mm -hmm. And the wrinkles have wrinkles have wrinkles. <laughs> and that tremendously increases the surface area mm -hmm. for the foods to be absorbed. As a matter of fact, so much, it's about 2,000 square feet, like the size of a baseball diamond. Wow. Ten-year-old Alex Sims is always on the move. He loves sports and he excels in school. Like her older brother, Courtney Sims is an athlete and a good student. They have a lot in common, including a digestive disorder. Last year I began to notice that Alex and Courtney were coming into my office complaining of um, stomach aches and gastric distress, you know, shortly after they ate their lunch. After months of doctor visits, their diagnosis revealed that Alex and Courtney had the same ailment, lactose intolerance. 
Lactose is a natural sugar found in milk and other dairy products. The enzyme that digests lactose is called lactase. When people don't have enough lactase to digest the lactose they consume, they're lactose intolerant. Dr. Richard Grand, an expert in lactose intolerance, has seen both Sims children. People with lactose intolerance, they have a lot of cramps and gas. They have discomfort. They feel embarrassed in public because they may have the urgency to pass gas. Um, they may actually do it, which is even more socially unacceptable. Undigested lactose draws fluid into the small intestine, causing bloating and cramps. It also feeds bacteria in the large intestine, which give off gas. Alex's comes out as, as acid reflux, so he has the constant burning. Courtney, on the other hand, gets excruciating stomach pain that just folds her right over. I'm just glad they found out what it was because they were constantly at the nurse's office missing school and uh, it was just an ordeal going through all that. Virtually every infant can digest milk, but after age five, many children lose their ability to process lactose. Up to 75% of African and African-American adults are lactose intolerant, and as many as 90% of people in some Asian countries. Very few Northern Europeans are lactose intolerant, but many Southern Europeans are. The strategy Dr. Grand worked out with the Sims family was part avoidance of milk products and part medication. What are you having for lunch today? Pizza. I do have medication here that I can give them when they know they're going to be eating something such as pizza or cheeseburgers for lunch. The pills contain an enzyme similar to lactase, which breaks down the lactose in milk products. When I eat pizza and I take the pill, I like I usually don't get the pain. I'd rather take a pill with my ice cream than get sick, because sometimes when I get sick, I um, kind of feel like I'm going to throw up. For Alex and Courtney, dealing with lactose intolerance is mostly a matter of applying their common sense, one slice of pizza or one glass of milk at a time. Now, if most of the food and the nutrients are absorbed from the small intestine, what's left for the large intestine to, to do? It stores whatever was not absorbed from the small bowel until we get it out as waste. It absorbs water so that we don't lose too much water. and has another very important function, which is to make vitamin K. Hmm. And it makes vitamin K from the normal bacteria that live in the bowel. And that vitamin K is very important to maintain normal blood clotting that you have in your body. Relax that down, just make a fist for me, open and close. Three years ago, Augustus McNeil had a colonoscopy, an inspection of the colon, which is the major part of the large intestine. Then the doctor found and removed some small growths called polyps. Five to ten percent of polyps become cancerous. So Augustus is back to learn if more polyps have appeared. To dull any discomfort, Augustus receives one drug to kill the pain and another to relieve anxiety. Sure. How you doing? Uh, okay. Let's start. Dr. Eric Libby inserts the colonoscope with its tiny video camera into the rectum, and it begins its five-foot journey. You don't really examine much on the way in because you want to get there as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So he's not feeling any of this? He may feel a little of it, but it's not anything that's uncomfortable. Let me know if you have any discomfort, OK? I'll give you some more medicine. Until recently, colonoscopy was not recommended for routine screenings. Instead, sigmoidoscopy, which examines only part of the colon, was the common procedure. 
Or do the polyps typically occur at, at a particular point in the colon? The most common place for them to be is in the last third of the colon, what's called the sigmoid. Advantage of a full colonoscopy is that you're not going to miss them at any point. So how often should um, someone, at what age should they start coming in for this procedure? We recommend it start at 50, mm -hmm. age 50. If a colonoscopy doesn't find any polyps, then we don't even repeat it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. If we do find polyps, then you should come back every three years. Colonoscopies can be this infrequent because polyps turn cancerous very slowly. Once he's reached the end of the colon, Dr. Libby slowly withdraws the colonoscope so he won't miss any problems. So now we're back in the sigmoid. This is the area we're most likely to find a polyp. Mm -hmm. Is this where his polyps were last time? Actually, no. Last time they were at the other end of the colon. That's an important point. A sigmoidoscopy would have missed those polyps, which could have become cancerous. Now there's a tiny little one there. Okay, those two little bumps are polyps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to remove these just with a biopsy forcep. If a polyp develops into cancer that's not detected until it reaches an advanced stage, it's almost a death warrant. The patient has only an 8% chance of surviving five years. This is the polyp. To remove it, Dr. Libby inserts a long wire through the colonoscope into the colon. It has a device attached to clip the polyp. There we go. Now, okay, open please. Good. I want to put it right on that little one there and close. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'll take it off. And you see, did you feel that, sir? Hold, well, please. No. And we'll send that to the lab and make sure that it's not anything cancerous or precancerous. And there's another one right there. By the time he's finished, Dr. Libby finds four small polyps. If they're not precancerous, Augustus won't need another colonoscopy for five years. If one is, he still won't have to return for three years. Colon cancer is the second most common cancer killer in the United States, but over half of all people that are found to have colon cancer are cured. Mm -hmm. Now, is it the number two because most people don't come in to get the screenings, to get the colonoscopies? That's right. Most colon cancer deaths could be prevented if a person was screened ahead of time. The digestive tract is the world's most amazing length of plumbing. It takes the food you eat, chops it into smaller and smaller pieces, then converts it into the fuel that keeps you alive. What you can do to help keep your digestive system in shape is eat a balanced diet, exercise, and take digestive symptoms seriously. I'm Kat Carney. Stay healthy. Keep watching. Discussion topics and activity and resources for the digestive system are up next on Assignment Discovery. Now that you've seen the digestive system, talk about this. Digestion is the process of breaking down food into a form that can be used by the body's tissues. Explain the functions of each part of the digestive system. What is the role of each part in aiding digestion? Why is digestion described as both a mechanical and a chemical process? Now try this. Design a science exhibit explaining the role of each part of the digestive system. Use common kitchen items, such as a blender or disposal, to recreate the digestive tract. For videos, CD-ROMs, lesson plans, and teacher resources on this topic and more, log on to discoveryschool.com. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests 50 Ways to Relieve Heartburn, Reflux, and Ulcers by M. Sarah Rosenthal. The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable communications industry and your local cable company.